Uh, we're going to talk today about product market fit. Um, let's do a little bit of data before we get going. How many of you have an IT or internet company? Or an IT or internet company idea? How about clean tech? Medical device? Biotech? Uh, we'll call it more analog type businesses. Maybe something in bioag or something like that. Got a few people like that. What did I, what did I miss? Sorry? Okay, advanced technology and manufacturing. Yep. And? Agritech. Agritech, yep. Okay. All right, so we've got a real cross section or a spectrum of different types of businesses and different interests in the room. Uh, I'll do a little bit of an introduction of what Rocket Builders is and what we focus on, and also a little bit about myself. Um, so this is my contact info. Um, if you want to email me afterwards, happy to sort of talk or do any something else if you have specific questions or things like that. Rocket Builders is a niche consulting company and it focuses on go to market. Our, our really our objective is to help companies that are trying to match their product to the marketplace or actually sorry it's the other way around is match the market need to the product they're going to build. Um, so we put, look at it that way and that's sort of the thing we, things that we focus on. Um, we do a ready to rocket list every year. So if you go to readytorocket.com, um, you can see a lot of the best tech companies in the province. And we go and we work as market analysts. We analyze what are the companies doing, which companies do we think are going to succeed. And there's a ready to rocket list, which is companies with revenue. And then there's an emerging list, which is often the early stage pre-revenue companies. Um, I also have a major hobby and... Uh, I run the sailing school at Jericho. It's a summer business. I've done that for many, many years. It's a sport that was very good to me. Uh, so I go down to the beach and stand on the beach for most of July and August to pretend I'm working. <laughs> so it's just sort of one of those sort of scenarios that we can go through. Um, today, we're going to talk about uh, managing your product. This is not building the product. It's not specifying it. It's not production. It's not about what its technical features are. It's managing of the product and understanding how you're going to match it with a marketplace. So what's the market research I do? How do I divide the market into different segments? How do I decide which segments are addressable? Not which segments are out there, but which ones can I actually talk to effectively and eventually have a business model to make money from. So we're going to talk a little bit about understanding consumers and we'll talk also about B2B. And... Uh, get an idea of something like that. So how many of you would have a B2B type product? How many B2C? Okay. How many B2G? G stands for government. Okay. How many of you put your hands up three times? <laughs> Don't do that. Okay. Okay. That's good. That's fine. No, it's all right. But if you have more than two segments, I'll also say later on, I'm going to ask that question again. Why do you have more than two segments? Okay. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about, about managing the product. In other words, uh, it's not just uh, what does it do and what's the ob objective behind selling it or getting hold of all sorts of different people, but what's the perception of the product in everybody's mind? Okay. How many of you are uh, Android users? Who's got an Android phone? How many are iPhone? How many of you just love switching back and forth? Not very many people, okay? So a lot of it is the perception of which is better or which is more usable or which is the one I have, <coughs> all right? So all those things go into the different things that we're going to talk about. And finally, we'll discuss product positioning and then how do you measure? And more and more, we believe that measurement is incredibly important. So... What are you trying to do? If you're a successful growth company, you're really trying to go through a series of steps. So you may have minimum viable product or you're working towards minimum viable product, but at the same time, you're really trying to go to the stage where you have a replicable revenue model. In other words, I know what the revenue will be. I have a business model that generates revenue for me. And I have an addressable market that is growing or I have a niche market that I can start in so that I can help my business survive. I go through these steps. And there's a lot of different ways of saying, you know, I can build something for anybody, but that's 
quite different than being able to market and sell to specific people. And that's one of the things we'll come back to repeatedly. Um, I'm going to go into market research. And actually, I'm just going to scroll back up really quickly to this. Uh, when we look at our overview, when you are doing the questions for some of the future rounds in New Ventures BC, some of the topics here today should be designed to help you with questions one and then five through nine. In other words, they're talking a lot about uh, why will your company grow, okay? Uh, why will it sort of move in the marketplace and some of the other pieces that are there. So if we talk about market research, uh, we have a number of things we want to do. But at the end of the day, we'll talk about why do we segment. And one of the things we really want to understand is, you know, if I segment the market and I sit down and say I can do all sorts of different things, it allows us to focus marketing and development resources on a specific part of the market. How many of the companies here have uh, more than $10 million for marketing and sales? Okay, first time, no hands, that's good. Okay, so none of you have enough money to boil the ocean. Okay, so that's one of the things that's really important to understand. And where I'm going with this is there's, these are handouts that are on the, the table for everybody. But at the end, we're gonna talk about how you would market and to which segments, and then what's it gonna cost? Okay, so a lot of the time, what you're trying to understand when you decide, do market research, is where can I afford to go, as well as what can I afford to do, and what can I afford to build? It's a whole variety of different things. So if I segment the market effectively, uh, it will narrow, narrow what we call the whole product definition, all right? So if I take a look at the market and I have uh, certain segments. Uh, if I decide that I'm going to sell inside North America rather than every single continent, it immediately narrows the market for me. It makes it easier for me to decide what I'm going to do. It can limit competition, all right? So if you're doing something and you go into a market where there are not a lot of other com you know, companies participating, it will limit competition. Whereas if there's all sorts of companies, especially the large guys doing something, competition may make it more difficult. It'll leverage past success into other segments. In other words, I may not go where all the money is at the beginning, but if I go somewhere and succeed, then I'm able to move, all right? Allows me to sort of transfer a little bit. And if I have market leadership or even a market toehold or a market presence in one market, the image I have and the visibility I have from that helps me to do different things. All right, so if you build a really nice little tech company and you end up with you know, more than a couple million in revenue, how many million dollars in revenue do you think you get to before one of the large companies becomes aware of you? Fortune 500, Fortune 5000. How many million dollars in revenue do you think you get to? 10 is closer. It's 10 is closer. Okay, so at a million dollars in revenue, you're just a bug they haven't even seen on the windscreen. Okay, when you get around 10 million in revenue, that's when they become aware of you. All right, so when you start off, quite often you're doing small things, which the larger companies don't even notice. So the idea that, oh, I don't have any competition, the reality is you do, they just haven't decided whether it's worthwhile or not. Okay, and they'll do that later. Okay, so you get a whole series of different things. Another way of putting it is to, you know, take a look or listen to what some of the people have said is whenever you get confused, go to the store. The customer has, a, customer has all the answers and all the money, all right? So quite often we'll hear companies who say, you know, I went out and I got 5,000 free downloads of my product off, you know, the, the Apple store. And you're going, great, that's nice. Um, how many of them use it regularly? How many users do you have, all the other stuff? How many of them are very happy to pay for it? Okay, you just, you, if you have only a free product, you don't know that answer, okay? And there's a very significant difference between them. So we'll go back to, uh, what was the great comment? So when, when Apple bought out the, was it the iPhone 6? They bought out, what was the large one, what was it called? The Plus, okay, so why did they bring out the, you know, six plus. Is it for old guys like me who can't see anymore? Or, you know, or people with big thumbs? What was the rationale? Sorry? 
Yeah, so Samsung already had a product. It was like, it was very clear Samsung was making money selling that product, so they're doing, they're competing. Um, so when they bought it out, what percent of Samsung users said, oh, I'm gonna switch to the Apple phone? What do you think? Not one, it's actually quite high, it was over 50%. So then, you know, that's interesting. So if you're Samsung, this is not a good thing, right? <clears throat> then those over 50% of people went and had a friendly talk with Rogers or Telus or whoever it was about switching and figured out that they actually had to pay money for the new phone. And the percentage that switched was far, far lower. So what people say and what people do are, are quite often very different things. All right, so one of the things you need to do is you need to be able to go out and understand the value proposition and also understand what behavior will be and why people are gonna do things. So when you're doing market research, one of the key things you're looking for is pain. In other words, what does a market have in terms of its requirements? What are the things that really create value? In other words, are the items that are more than just you know, a couple features and stuff like that. So we can categorize according to size trends, different market segments, uh, different things like that. Uh, customer pain, value chain pain, all sorts of different things. You know, and then what are the requirements? And the requirement may be uh, something that the customer has, and then the requirement may be something that the way it's purchased, the channel has. In other words, the way things happen. How many of you really like buying uh, pharmaceuticals and prescription drugs on the internet, just based on some random website you can find? Who does that? Okay, so not most, many of us really appreciate that system because we're not sure whether, what we're actually getting. So the channel for buying prescriptions is usually, or buying prescription drugs, usually involves a physician you trust who is certified and regulated, providing a regulated certified drug to you, okay? And that's a really a requirement of the channel and it becomes a requirement of the consumer. Okay, so there's a whole series of different things. It's very different than buying lottery tickets or, you know, some information you get for free from Google. And it could be, you know, real news, fake news, could be poorly written news, whatever it is. There's a whole series of different things. But uh, what you're trying to understand is really not just what do people want to buy, but how do they buy it? And the, the complexities of what the different parts of the work at. So I can segment the market a couple of ways, um, and we have what we call revolutionary products, and we have evolutionary products. Um, so a revolutionary product, if you look at it historically, things like electric light, not electric, but artificial light, you know, electricity that's distributed to everybody's house, those are pretty good, right? So most of us benefit from them today. In the last 30 years, what are the things that are really revolutionizing stuff? What are the big things that are happening? What do you think? Who's got an idea? Mobile, mobile is a big thing. And mobile is still changing stuff. But why is mobile so good? What happened just before mobile? Cloud computing, Cloud computing is nice. That's good. But what fuels all of this stuff? Even Homer Simpson understands. <laughs> the internet. Okay. All right. <clears throat> so the, things like the internet, cloud, mobile, connectivity, uh, encrypted databases, or secure transmission of stuff is a very, very uh, significant change, and they're a revolutionary product. So a smartphone is probably a revolutionary product. How much we depend on it, and how much we use it now. Or how much, you know, I have a couple kids who are, one's a teenager and one's uh, in her early 20s, and how much they use them where everybody else uses a laptop or even a tabletop or something like that is quite different. Uh, the other type of product is an evolutionary product. So iPhone 5 to iPhone 6, the different steps, they're evolutionary. They get better, they make a big difference, okay? Not a big difference, but they make a difference. So quite often things will move ahead relatively slowly and there are very significant opportunities to do things. So what's something that sort of snuck up on everybody in the last 10 years? Something that was there that sort of mimics human behavior, but the fact that it was gonna be internet-based is different. What do, think, what do people think? What's an idea? Uh, yeah, I think, well, half of Vancouver's already out of work, but yeah. <laughs> okay. So artificial intelligence will change things dramatically. That, I actually see that as a market of the future. We're just on the cusp of that. 
So for example, if I go back 10 or 15 years ago, the growth of social media and social media platforms, people always were like that. They just mirror how we do things today. And they've actually enhanced the social experience that we have. So it may, to a certain extent, have replaced community as we know it, or it's a different type of community, but it's certain as it also leverages cloud, mobile, internet and stuff, becomes a very, very strong communication device. So when we look at it and we talk about a lot of the different things that are happening, we really need to understand, why do I do this? You know, wh why do I care? And if we go to some of the people who are experts in the area or well-known in the area, Mark Andreessen, obviously one of them, his comment is the number one company killer is lack of market. You'll go out and you'll find all sorts of different companies that are really interesting product. They succeed. Everything goes well. But the thing they're missing is market acceptance. They just can't move along and do that. So one of the very well-known venture capital companies in Vancouver for many years did what they call a loss analysis. So every once in a while they'll have a deal that doesn't work. You know, they may put millions of dollars into something, but at the end of the day it just doesn't work. And they close the company and they lose all the money. And they went through a loss analysis of the companies that have been in their portfolio over decades and said, you know, what happened? And they did that with something like 38 companies. And usually they put things in categories. The product wasn't good enough, the people weren't good enough, or we never met the market. And with the people, you can change them out. So it's really that sort of removes that. It's either product or market. And in 36 out of 38 cases, they said, we just never met the market. It was, and you take out biotech because drug discovery is a bit different. But it was only a couple times when they felt that the product never met what was required. So it's quite often you can build the right stuff, but finding the market acceptance is one of the key things that's important. And what we want is to get the product market fit. So I'm going to play a short video by a guy called Steve Blank. Is it already queued up or do I just... I think it's already queued up, so we'll just go with that. Yeah. I realized that this might actually be a fundamental problem with most startups, is that actually startups were burning money by starting sales and marketing and business and development activities either on the web or physically in the real world way too early. Because if you think about it, here we are in Silicon Valley, at least those of us not, those of us physically here, not those watching on TV. But for those of us here in the Valley, we take technical risks with products all the time. Investors put huge bets on all of you to do innovative things. Anybody have any idea what percentage of startups fail because their technology fails? Any idea? How many think it's over 50% of startups fail because the technology didn't work? Right. Over 50%. Over 25%. How many think it's over 25% fail? Because technology doesn't make it. Turns out less than 10% of startups fail because the engineers were just wrong. Turns out most startups, and I'll leave life sciences aside for a second, most startups in every other field other than life sciences, over 90% fail because they didn't find a market and customers, full stop, big idea. Well, if that's the case, if, and go ask your favorite venture capitalist or next guest, and you're going to have a lot of them in this class and other class, go ask them. If that's the case, why is it that we have tons of methodologies to measure and help us getting the product right, but no methodologies to help us get the stuff about customers and markets right. Anybody ever been in a company with, in product management or know what product management people do? There's some people in the back of the room. 
there's entire tool sets on how to manage technology risk. Tons. But there are almost no tools to manage customer and market risk. Well, think about this. You're an entrepreneur. I have a great idea. Good, let's go build it. Oh, good, let's go raise money. Oh, let's go sell it. You know what the next step is? Oh, we're out of business. <laughs> because most of us grow up reading these wonderful stories about all the people who made a ton of money at Google and Facebook and other companies that, like, these are great examples. You ever notice they don't bring in the people who you didn't hear about? Because you wouldn't come. How about bringing in the people who said, you know, I cratered my last seven companies. Let me tell you why. You'd go, well, I don't want to be one of those. I want to be Google and Facebook. That's whose uh, presentations I want to hear. Any idea what the ratio is between the Googles and Facebooks and other startups? You know how many companies fail every year in Silicon Valley? Anybody want to guess? You know what the ratio is? I'm sorry? Over 1,000 to 1. Now, one of the nice things about human nature is every one of you is going to be convinced that you're going to be Google and Facebook. You have to be, right? I mean, that's the passion of an entrepreneur. You have to be convinced. You know, those other 999 companies, they were just idiots. I am much smarter than them because I have a better idea and we're cool. I think it's going to auto run. Okay, so one of the things he says is the failure rate is, you know, 90, 999 out of 1,000. Their definition of failure is maybe a little different than other people's in Silicon Valley. So if 10 years from now you run a nice little company that makes $10 million a year, that's not necessarily failure. Okay, you're doing okay. So that's fine. Um, he does have an interesting point of view, though, in that he says he, everywhere, Silicon Valley and stuff, one of the key components is making sure that you do get product market fit. Um, we have more chairs at the front. If anybody in the back wants to come up and sit down, there's, you know, there's more seats up here if anybody wants to move. If you see okay. someone's hand up, that means they've got room at their table. Right. <clears throat> Thank you. So a couple of things we're trying to do are that you're really trying to understand um, how to build a business model. I want to build something. I want to measure what happens to it in the marketplace. I want to learn from it. So big companies like IBM and Microsoft, they execute in a market because they've been there a long time. It's very difficult for a small company to do the same thing. So what you're really interested in doing is making a prediction, going into the marketplace. I think this is what's going to occur. Talk to the customers, do all the different things for a market, and then come back and say this is what reality is. There's a little square in the corner of this slide, which is uh, Next Computers, and it's the very original Steve Jobs video of when he's talking to everybody who works at Next, and it goes back to 1990. And he does all of the right things, where he, what's the value proposition, which are the growth segments, uh, exactly why will they purchase, why will the competitors not be able to respond quickly, and why do we have a product that fits? So he does all of those things. We don't have enough time to, to see that today, but when you, if you download the slides and stuff, there's a neat video embedded in that. Um, so I'm not saying that top down isn't good, but every time somebody says, you know, I'm gonna get 10% of a $2 billion market, you're like, ooh. So a lot of the investors in Vancouver will say, that's code for I don't know who I'm gonna sell to, and that's not good, okay? It's better to say, I know who is gonna sell to me. So one of the things we understand is that revenue is not a function of market share, size and penetration rates, it's really linear algebra. So I have to sit down and say, you know, I could have 2% of a billion dollar market, which is $20 million in revenue. That's quite different than saying, I know how many leads I have, I know what my percentage is of my conversion rate, I know what my price is, so that actually tells me what my revenue is, all right? So one of the things you're trying to do is go from the top down to bottom up. Um, there's another link in this one, which is all about how to not do a market analysis, and it's Ali G pitching Donald Trump. So I'll let you watch that one at your leisure. 
Um, but it's, uh, it's a little bit about why big numbers aren't necessarily always effective unless you're trying to get elected, I guess. So, um, so top-down is valuable. So it's the total addressable market can be helpful. It tells you why you're going into the marketplace. It also tells you why if this product or product line or series of services succeeds, uh, why eventually there will be significant market growth. Uh, I see Mike Volkers here and a few other people uh, who've been in the market a while. Um, one of the things that we believe is the total addressable market, it tells a small company why their product will eventually be a uh, $100 million product after the small company has been sold to the big guy who has worldwide distribution. And we actually think that that's one of the things that happens is that you will never get to a full total addressable market when you're a small company, especially in a limited number of years. <coughs> It's when you're incorporated into the big, bigger aspects of something else, okay? So you go through a series of steps. What's the theoretical market, the potential market, all the different things, and it tells you that there is an addressable market and a market demand. So when I go down and I cascade down through this, one of the things that's really important for everybody to consider is um, I can sit down and say, what is market demand at the very end? How many of you have bought a new car in the last three years? Okay, what's the average buying cycle for buying new car? What, what is it now? What's the average number of years that people keep a car before they buy a new one? It's 12, okay? So if I have a total of addressable market for new car sales, the number that are purchased every year is 1 12th. So these numbers shrink relatively rapidly, all right? So there's a whole series of things that are different. So the buying cycle, the adoption rate, all of those things are factors in understanding, you know, what part of the market really is available every year because you're trying to do an annual forecast, one of the things you're doing. So if I go bottom up, I can sit down and say, how am I going to do this? So a lot of the companies here are business to business companies. So how much is an available budget every year, all right? Do they spend X number of dollars on new types of technologies? What's my market reach? Am I able to go out and really talk to all sorts of people? Uh, what's the attach rate? So I can talk to all sorts of people, but how many of them actually listen to me and become more than they're just, you know, there's awareness, but they actually even consider that I'm part of this. And then I, what do I convert into a lead? And then what's finally my win rate amongst what I'll call the leads that are available? So again, it becomes linear algebra, algebra in a little while, but it, it's a big factor in terms of what do I do? So if I go to a trade show and I talk to 400 people and I end up with a dozen really effective leads and I close on two out of 12, then you can see what the math would be when I go down through something like that. And um, there's a whole series of different steps. So I keep showing uh, that, you know, the pins in a bowling alley in some of the slides. And one of the things we're really trying to come around to is the concept of a bowling alley model. In other words, we have a series of things that we want to do and uh, we have a head pin. And the head pin is usually a very specific segment and it's in a niche market and it's a segment with a must-have value proposition it's where I go first. It isn't where all the money is necessarily, it's where I can succeed. And it's a distinct group of people that will really make a difference, okay? Somebody who really needs to have the solution that I have. Uh, so you can get all sorts of different people who might want to buy your product or could buy your product, and that's nice, but at the same time, it doesn't really necessarily match up with what you need to do. Because where we're trying to go is we're trying to understand the market. So when you're building your product or your service and stuff, you have an internal focus. So I have features, I'm trying to decide what to put in it, I build one or minimum viable product. What does the customer value, all right? So I can have lots or I can have differentiated value. What are the things that are the key purchasing factors for them? Um, I can have reactive R&D. Every time I talk to somebody, they want something new, okay? Or I can say, I know what my head pin segment has to have in order for them to buy, and that's all I need to build right now, okay? And at the end of the day, we're trying to get to a reliable customer base from unpredictable results. And when I do this, <coughs> Key things I can do is I can do secondary research. You know, what's the market size? Go on the internet, uh, read Gartner reports, do all sorts of different things like that. 
if I have a history in a certain marketplace, I can look at everything else that's like that, or I can do primary research. It's a lot harder, but it's more valuable. And if you can go and talk to the customer or the distribution channel partners or the people who are surrogates for the customer, it's unbelievably important. It can be anecdotal. It doesn't have to be 20% of them said this. It can just be, I had an in-depth discussion with someone who's a C-level executive at a business company that's in my target market, and these are the problems they have. They have seven problems, but I can probably really only solve two, so that's given me very, very good, important data. It's told me something, okay? Just want to digress a little bit and talk a little uh, bit more about technology, adoption, and a couple other things, and buyer behavior. Uh, but as I leave, I'll call it segmentation, understanding the market and stuff, are there any questions? I've been skipping around a fair bit, but are there any sort of trends? Angie's standing here with the microphone if anybody's got questions. Or should I just keep rolling? Yeah, somebody at the back. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Had to be at the back, didn't you? <laughs> My question is, uh, what is that reactive R&D mean? So, sorry, what? The reactive R&D, you have that? Uh, oh, so one of the things that companies often get is that, let's say they go and start talking to people. Uh, they're really talking to a multitude of people and they may, all, they may all look the same, but in reality they have different needs and different values. And they become reactive because every time they talk to somebody, it's like, oh, this person wants X, that person wants Y, this person wants Z. In reality, they're all in different segments. Okay, and whenever you're talking to people in multiple segments, your scope of what you're trying to do with your product becomes enormous. Okay, and you're trying to avoid that. All right, so that's one of the things that's there is, so if I go from reactive R&D to a head pin segment, I try to understand exactly what that head pin segment wants. And I'm, I'm trying to go from one to the other by saying, these guys are nice, but I, I don't think I can meet their needs right now. I'm gonna focus on these people. Great, so we'll talk about technology adoption. Um, why do they buy? What's in it for them? Um, so if we understand how they will buy a new technology or new service, we get an idea of uh, timing for a marketing strategy, how and when. So is there anybody here who ta uh, targets education, higher ed, K to 12? So we've got one, so we've got one or two people who are gonna do that. So K to 12, and higher ed is different in one way, very significantly different than selling to business to business. When's the buying season? Okay, big businesses usually budget in the fall, you know, go through all sorts of ruminations and buy in the new year, usually Q1, Q2, probably Q2. Universities and everybody else, they have no time to look at stuff in the fall because that's when all the students are there. So their buying season is the summer. So it's a different phase for timing. So understanding slight differences in the marketplace has really helped you. <clears throat> so I used this example before of this, of the internet and how important it is and what it means. And it really is, uh, you know, more and more, even for the clean tech companies, the biotech companies, the guys that are here, if your website does not reflect effectively what you do, everybody you talk to is gonna be looking at your website and looking at the LinkedIn profile of your company and your LinkedIn profile and all the other stuff instantly if you get them on the phone. And if it isn't consistent and isn't correct, you're really tying one hand behind your back. Okay, so you make a difference. So internet buying behavior. We do all sorts of things. Uh, again, this slide's a little bit uh, old, but now we know that 90% of search starts with, uh, with mindset of internet buying behavior starts with search. So, you know, that's interesting, but where does it fit in the buying process? And you'll go through a number of different stages. So you can say, you know, when I'm searching or when companies are searching for stuff, they're looking for solutions, they're looking for opportunity, but their behavior changes over time. So you could be one of 10 companies that can do something um, and they have, you have great conversations with stuff. Uh, but at the end of the day, you don't necessarily succeed. So there's a really neat company around town called Carbio, which helps people with sales and lead generation do really well. And 
Colin is the CEO, and his, his comment was, I built my own CRM because I had a couple people who wanted a specialty CRM. So I had two customers for my customer relationship management software product or CRM. And three years later, I still had two customers for my CRM product. I just wasn't growing rapidly enough. Um, so what does this chart tell you? So who's probably the first person who would connect to you to ask you questions? Is it, a, is it a technical person, a finance person, a sales guy? Who's probably the first person who's going to connect to you if you ever get contacted by a, comp a large company that is trying to buy something? Who do you think? Person who has a problem, okay. Um, but let's say there's a group of people who've decided they have a problem. Who gets nominated to go first and look? How many people say, to me, it's always the technical guy, usually. It's the technical buyer who comes first. And the reason they do that is they just want to qualify everybody. So all the engineers in your company will just have a fantastic conversation with this guy, and he has no right to buy anything. Okay, so you're going to remember that part, all right? So there's other things. Then as you progress, it's does it meet all my needs? Does it integrate with everything I have? And what does it say at the end? Okay, so when I look at it, brand becomes important. Who's ever heard the statement, nobody ever got fired for buying Microsoft Office? Okay, so what it is is I go through and I, oh, there were 10 companies, now there's seven. I buy from the big guy because I don't take any risk. So there's a whole series of things that are important in buying process. This is totally different than in the consumer world where people have, you know, spur of the moment decisions. So all the chocolate bars and gum which are inflicted upon you when you're trying to go through the cashier at Safeway with your children, those are all impulse purchases. Those are easy. They're at the opposite end. For consumers, the biggest purchase you'll make is probably a house, right? So you end up very consultative. You hire a professional, call a real estate agent, all that sort of stuff. Actually, the anomaly there is um, the second most expensive one, and that's a car. And uh, so they say if you go to the auto mall in Richmond and you go into the pickup section, it's all guys walking around who've already bought a car based on what it looked like. They're just trying to figure out if they got a good deal. Okay. So um, how many people are involved? So the number of people in business to business or even complex consumer purchases is quite high. And social media has made consumer purchasing more and more a community type or friend event. I said I run a sailing school. More and more people uh, come and say, oh, I was referred to you by somebody I know, friends like that. And in different cultures, the re reference market is very, very strong. Okay, it's perhaps less strong in some sectors than in others, but there it is. So you look at the number of people who are involved. If this is a government sale, does that number go up or down? Up, okay, good. At least we know that it takes a long time, okay? If you have lots of people involved, does it make the decision better? Does it increase cost? Yes. yes. Does it reduce risk? No. Yes, for the people who make the decision. Because all of a sudden you can blame it on everybody else. Okay. So who are the buyer participants in the buying process? A whole series of steps. You got a bunch of people. Who are the different things they're going to go through? You have to make sure you understand who you're talking to and also that you have an argument for each one. So in some cases, you only need two or three of these. Others, you'll, it'll be relatively complex. You'll have all this stuff. So a couple of questions. Segmentation 101. Do you need to build every feature potential customers ask for? No, even Dilbert doesn't do that. Okay. Uh, why or why not? The real answer is they may be in multiple segments. You cannot succeed in every single segment. Is differentiation based only on your product? No. It can often be based on how you sell it, who your partners are. Let's say I'm selling my consumerish product through Best Buy. The fact that it's even in the store at Best Buy or it's on Amazon or things that give you validation really improves that. If you're in the medical market, whether it's device or something else, if Johnson & Johnson is part of, you know, partnering with you to, to package or help you with the product is a very, very significant qualifier and validator. Okay, just going to move on real quick. One of the final things that's here is a uh, competitive matrix. And I'm not going to do anything with it today, but it's in the slides. 
One of the things I would suggest you do is take a look at it and go, where's us? Where's our competitor one or two? And don't do this for five years from now, do it for one year from now. Where are we gonna be in the first year? Because everybody can dream about five years from now. Okay, that's easy, but it's green. All right, and then look at what are the different things that are part of the competitive matrix? What's, where does competition come from? If you look at this list, you'll notice that the first half a dozen variables have nothing to do with the product. It's all about what the support is, how is it sold, all the other different pieces. Okay. Let's talk a little bit about a whole product, and this is something that we harp on a bit just because it's, um, for small companies, quite often who you partner with or what your distribution is really makes a difference. So if anybody has an app, and if they're not selling it in the Android store or in the Apple store, uh, you have incredible trouble distributing your product. Let's be realistic, okay? So it's all of the associated factors in the whole product, all the different things that come together, okay? Uh, and what do they do? How does it make your whole product better and all the different things? And it can be many things, okay? So you can look at it and say it can be support for, it can be support afterwards. Uh, it can be all sorts of different complementary pieces and it can be connectivity. There's a really neat book, Crossing the Chasm by Jeffrey Moore. I think many of you have heard of it. Um, th it goes into this quite well. And also another book uh, that he wrote with Clayton Christensen, The Name Escapes Me, is actually quite good at doing this. So it helps you a fair bit with uh, all the different things that you might sit down and say, what do I need? But you look at whole product and say, here's a whole series of different things that go into a product. And what is the thing that's really, really important? What's the key thing that's in there? So a year or so ago, I went to a hockey tournament down in the Seattle area with my son. He's playing midgets. Uh, all the kids are 15, 16, and 17. Which hotel do you think we stayed in? Sorry? So you gotta stay in the, so very clearly we stayed in the vacation traveler hotel. Okay, go around the wheel, which, and which are the, um, what are the, what's the number one thing that was the seller for those guys? Because the guy who's the coach of the team walked in and said, we can stay in any one of these three hotels. And they're all pretty similar when you go around the wheel. And what was number one? Breakfast buffet. Breakfast buffet. You got it. Okay. Team captain immediately said, if we have an early game, are we allowed to eat before the game and come back and eat again? That was the single thing they wanted to know. Everything else was, I don't care what the room looks like. It's like, that's the number one seller. So a lot of the time, people buy things for one reason. Okay, what's the key thing that's important? It may not be where they get all the value, and quite often what they buy it for isn't where they get all the value later, but that's how it works. Okay, so another great example is uh, is coffee shops. So Dunkin' Donuts is equivalent in the US of Tim Hortons, and years ago, there's a great, um, actually there was an interesting, you can find it on the internet if you search, it's out of Boston, where they did a comparison of the two coffee shops. And the way they did it was they gave a bunch of Starbucks people a $100 gift card and said, we want you to go to Dunkin' Donuts for a month, and the Dunkin' Donuts guys went to Starbucks. And then they interviewed them afterwards and said, what did you think, and how many of you would switch? So, question, what percentage do you think switched? Pass. Who else got a guess? 15. I heard a number at the back. Somebody says zero. The guy who's got zero is correct. Okay? So, and the comments were great. It's like all the Starbucks guys are like, well, I go there and there's four mica tables and everybody's wearing baseball caps and, um, you know, and all the donuts have sugar on them and all this sort of stuff. And then the guys go to, uh, the, the Dunkin' Donuts guys go to Starbucks and they're like, you go there and they got sofas. And, uh, you know, and it's sort of the biscuits are tiny and stuff. And the best comment was one guy said, it's like uh, spending, it's like having Christmas with people you don't know. <laughs> that was his comment on Starbucks. But it turns out that they're very, totally different tribes. And they have different value sets. It's not the coffee. It's not the coffee at all. Okay? So I'm going to leave that. I'm going to go on into positioning <clears throat> and, and talk a bit about positioning. And it's, why will they buy from us? and um, versus our competition. So there's a couple definitions of, of positioning. One of them is managing the product and presentation to fit a predetermined place in the mind of the customer. 
In reality, it's market segmentation plus competitive differentiation. So my wife drives a very safe car. What type of car does she drive? Volvo. Volvo. Okay, thank you. That's wrong, actually, but it's a very good example. She, my wife is actually Scandinavian. I think Volvo just means very expensive spare part. Okay, they haven't won a safety award in a decade, if anybody wants to know, but we all think they're safe. They're just expensive. No, she drives a Prius, but I don't understand that either. <laughs> okay. We th she told me we were going to get our money back on gas. I said, oh, my God. Okay. <clears throat> so more definitions of what's the perceived status within the marketplace. Everybody who has an iPhone pays a premium. How many of you are happy to trade your iPhone in for a, a different phone? No hands. Okay. All right. So... What you're trying to do is understand how you build a relationship to secure something in it. And early stage companies often do that by doing a little bit of custom work, having better customer support. In other words, I have a better relationship with my early customers. They know they're not getting something in a box or there's nobody at the other end of the helpline. All those things are different, but you cannot fall in the trap of doing that all the time because then you're actually providing value that you cannot afford to provide on a long-term basis. So if I position my product effectively and I have the impact of it, there's all the different things that will help me with it. And I can have more impact if I do things. So one of the key ones is partnerships, okay? I can also price my product a certain bit. I can say, you know, uh, what do I do in terms of distribution? What are the different steps? And another model is I can go through a process to decide how will I position my product, understand who's in the marketplace. All right, and I can go through a series of exercises. And one of the ones I would suggest that everybody does is go through the product positioning. Okay, and there's actually um, a series of questions you can answer. Uh, what are the questions? And I can go through all the way down and say, you know, what is the customer? Who is it? What do they need? What's our product? What's the differentiation? What's the whole product? And finally, how do I have a specific, specific positioning statement at the end. One caveat I'll make is the third item here is what is the product. Quite often people will launch in and talk about customers and I still, after they've been talking for 30 seconds, don't know whether they're hardware, software, or what. So quite often it's better to categorize your product at the beginning and move number three to the top so people know what you do at the beginning. So you can look at it another way and say, um, you know, what does it include? What are the criteria? And there are a whole series of things that need to be included in it. And then you'll sit down and say, I'm going to write this out in six sentences. Okay? Because every time somebody goes, and it includes, then all of a sudden you're getting the laundry list of features. Don't do that. Okay? Six very clear, maybe one or two part sentences. This is how it works and what it does. Okay? That's what you're looking for. And as a, an example, here's... Uh, Positioning example from the very first Apple iPod, okay? And uh, this was written uh, two years before they ever launched the product. So they knew where, where they were going to sell it before they ever did it. Um, who owned one of these? Anybody buy one? Everybody bought, you guys all paid 700 bucks for that thing? Yeah, okay. So... One of the key things is there is that it's uh, $700 because they could only build a few of them. They couldn't build eight million like they do now. Okay, so it had to be priced higher. So the very first thing is the mobile high un income individual. So it turns out that the original buyers for the iPod were very similar to the original buyers for the Blackberry. Is the people had the money and were mobile and wanted to use it that way. Version two, version three, version four, <coughs> all of them change a little bit, but uh, one of the things that uh, you get is you sit down and say um, they were able to evolve and grow from segment to segment. Originally, they only released it in four or five cities, like Silicon Valley, Austin, Texas, Chicago, New York. You're going to sell it in Iowa? I don't think so. Okay. And the value proposition at the bottom is people were prepared to pay for music a second time if they could actually get it on the device and play it. Because at the beginning, they didn't work very well. And it actually worked better than all of the other inferior substitutes. Another example, we'll go to, to coffee, right? Starbucks. And this is the original position statement written for Starbucks. 
Uh, he does two things really well here. He validates, which I said before, and he's talking about the experience of coffee, not about the beans or the technical features of the product or anything like that or the taste. He's just talking about how they want to provide a different atmosphere and almost a sort of fit into a certain lifestyle. And when he goes in the unlike piece, he compares it to old inferior technology. So it's very difficult for a small company to go and say, you know, we have this great algorithm, Google, oh, they're terrible. You know, it just doesn't work. People shut you off when you say that. But if you have a new way of doing things, you compare yourself to older technology, okay? And that's more acceptable and easier to communicate. A um, couple other quick examples. Who remembers this? What was the very original tagline for FedEx? Uh, I, I think that's on the door, isn't it? Yeah, but that wasn't number one. The very first one was when it absolutely positively has to get there. So FedEx is an example of a company that has uh, evolved from being a courier company based on speed to a worldwide courier company, then an office store company, and now everything you want to do in your office worldwide, because they bought, what is it, the, they have the stores and all the other stuff all over the place. Sorry? Yeah, they bought Kinko's, and they now have basically remote office anywhere in the world for you. So they've done that. Um, there's a positioning example. There's a link in there if you want to watch 25 different videos. Uh, but again, it shows you how to people typecast positioning and they do it really effectively. So one of the tests for you when you're doing uh, positioning is can you take your product and say this is what our positioning is and, uh, you know, if you can put your competitor's product in there, you're not differentiated enough. So a lot of the time when people send me stuff, it's electronic, I'll take their positioning statement and I'll put the whole thing and feed it into Google. If it shows me the IBM website, they have a problem, okay? All right, so you can take whole pieces, like sentences, and put it in Google, and it'll, it'll move you into certain areas and stuff, okay? So positioning is one of the key things in uh, servicing markets, all right? Quite often, early-stage customers will put up with things that don't work 100% correct. They can be correct, but as long as they know that you're going to move somewhere, it's effective, and if they think that you are focused on them, not on everybody, they'll be interested in working with you. So you can have a software product which is really, really good for running doctor offices, and your website can be all about doctors, but it's really hard to sell it to a dentist, even though fundamentally the technical issues they have in patient management may be unbelievably similar. Okay? Any questions about positioning? It's one of the most interesting parts, but I'm going to move on. Unless, questions? Okay. Got a couple more pieces I want to do real quick. Um, there's a speaker this afternoon who will talk about pricing in a lot of detail. So I'll just have two slides as a setup for Stephen Fort. And uh, one of the things that I want to do are talk about common pricing issues. Um, how many of you have ever said, oh, your uh, customers tell you your price is high or too low? You, know, you, you sometimes get discussions like that, but there's some people who always tell you your price is too high. It could be free and they'll tell you your price is too high. Okay, so that's one of the realities. So you can have different pricing models. And there is a great uh, link on HubSpot's website right now, which is, uh, it's called the worst SaaS software pricing model. And they go out and they flame about seven companies. Uh, you know, fortunately, they're all their customers that they help fix it. <coughs> So it's the before and afterwards, and it's one, one company had like eight versions, and it was like, oh, it's just so complicated. Okay, but what is the model? How does the model match the marketplace? Uh, do you offer promotional pricing? Different than discounting, okay? Promotional pricing, our best examples are telcos and phone plans, okay? You get a deal at the beginning. Hopefully, it's not so complex you can't understand what they're talking about, like the telcos. But the idea is that you do, you know, first two months free or whatever the scenario is. Different licensing alternatives and discounts you provide to resellers. Remember that if you are going to sell through channel, they have to make money too. And a question. <coughs> no. Okay. I teach uh, an introduction to business class at Simon Fraser University. And a lot of students, a lot of kids think, oh, I'm going to the marketplace. I, I have to sell something that's inexpensive. Absolutely not. Your price is a reflection of your positioning. So if you've got a fancy, fantastic product, but it all of a sudden is, 
you know, oh, it's one-tenth the price of a competitive product from Microsoft, it's silly, it doesn't work. People will say, oh, it's so low, it probably doesn't work, or it doesn't have all the stuff I need in it. Okay, if you're a premium product, you need to fit into the marketplace. Combination of cost, combination of what does the market do, and, and thirdly, where do you want to fit in the marketplace in the perception? Yeah? So I think the comment was that uh, one of the key things is that it's about perceived value proposition in the market sector. And it's really hard to match the perceived value if your price is totally out of, out of whack, especially if it's too low. I mean, it's, if it's too low, everybody thinks you're in the Dollarama category. It just isn't gonna work necessarily. Okay, um, I got about 15 minutes left, so I got a few things I wanna keep going through. Um, talk about product marketing things you can do, and uh, also then we'll go into metrics and analytics. How many of you have used more than two of these tools? Okay, the rest of you need to get on it, okay? Go out and figure out what is Alexa? What are, you know, Google Analytics, different things. Uh, keywords tools. Um, there's a phenomenal product right now available on Facebook which allows you to geofence, allows you to segment based on age, a bunch of whole different things. You know, cultural background and everything else, and you'll figure out what it, what it is pay per click to get clicks out of that group for your advertising and stuff. So all of these tools are really good because it helps you when you get into metrics and stuff, but it also really helps you understand who's even gonna look from the beginning when you're doing things, okay? So there's a whole bunch of really interesting products. And you see HubSpot and Hootsuite at the bottom. A lot of people think that they only work with social media, but they actually are products which do a whole variety of different things, okay? And they're pretty good for complementing things like Google Analytics and other stuff. <clears throat> so as I said earlier on, there's a really good book by HubSpot. It's called Internet Marketing. Um, that's the actual book itself. They, it's free. You, they've handed out 160,000 copies. There's a link embedded in there. Hopefully it's still... They move it around a little bit, but hopefully that link will allow you to go and download a free copy. It's 40, 50 pages long, it's easy to read, and it's got a whole bunch of quality tips about internet marketing in it. Um, and these are the different things that it does. It talks about all the different components that are there. So Steve Blank has a fantastic book, The Entrepreneur Startup Guide, but it's about 700 pages of reading. And uh, if you have insomnia, it's great. Um, <laughs> But actually, one of the key things with Steve Blank's book is always read the last five pages of every chapter. The best stuff's at the back, okay? But it's phenomenal, but it takes a lot of time. This is a little bit lighter, okay? Different things you can do for internet marketing. And I've said this earlier on, but for the clean tech and biotech companies and other companies that are involved, uh, really understanding how you use the internet is important. I said before that uh, I run a sailing school 100% of our marketing spend is online now. We've gone away from little newspaper ads, all the other different things. We are very active on Instagram, very active on Facebook. We advertise on Facebook. We pay for Google AdWords at different times, different combinations. Um, we have um, content that's in Mandarin. And we have a whole variety of pieces. And when we advertise on Facebook, we'll advertise with different cultural groups. One of the key things that helps us too is that we have a major partner. It's UBC Summer Camps. It's the by far the most trusted name in the summer camp industry or business in Vancouver. And we spend a lot of, they are a reseller for us. And every time they make money, it's great for us too because it increases and validates our image in the marketplace and it helps us a lot. <coughs> okay, there's a bunch of different tools. So everybody have a look at this one. And this is something that Rocket Builders uses. It's a marketing wheel, and there are a series of digitally based things you can do to market your product and some analog things. And a couple of them are both, okay? So advertising, for example, can be both or either. But when you look at this wheel, you have all sorts of choices. Um, so I like everybody to have a quick look at this and say, I go around here, what are my top two? So if you're in a heavy duty, industrial area, it could actually be the, um, the association website and the newsletter that goes out to the specific professionals in that specific area. They could be something, it's maybe not something that's an obscure part that's not on the tool, on the wheel, 
Uh, it's not Facebook, because they may or may not be interested in Facebook, but it can be a variety of different things. What are the different types of promo that I'm gonna do? And again, do it for the first year. Six months to a year, not five years from now, because you gotta get there. You can't just say, oh, five years from now, I'll be doing everything. The reality is you can't do everything today, <coughs> okay? Um, I'm gonna digress a tiny bit and talk about social media platforms a little bit. There are a whole series of social media platforms out there. This uh, image is a little old, doesn't show everybody, but they do different things, all right? So you can say, oh yeah, I'm gonna get social media. It's not like buying gas at Chevron, okay? It isn't just, a, it's a generic product. You have to decide which one will you use, why will you use it? <coughs> As I said before with the sailing school, active on Facebook, active on uh, Instagram, or do some stuff on Twitter, but more than anything, who are the trusted websites, including our own website, that has all the information that people want to find? Okay, so we wanna make sure that we have the right type of image in different places. We have an image on LinkedIn, and we have a page on LinkedIn, but that's not a primary buying area for people. You know, it's, it's a recreational product, it doesn't fit. Okay, so interesting stats, especially recently, 93% of all business to business marketers are engaging in some form of social media marketing. How many of you actively media, uh, market on social media? Okay, fair number of you do. So looking at the hands, it's about a third of the people here. And where do they put the focus? If it's on LinkedIn, is it on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, each one of them is different in terms of what it will do. We encounter a lot of companies in the business to business world that are very, using, uh, very active on LinkedIn, very cognizant of their profile and they have a lot of their senior people, very active LinkedIn profiles. And then they go out and they say, our target market is this, the typical people in the buying group are these type of job descriptions and then they will go and look at all the companies, they'll figure out who they are on LinkedIn, try to connect to them and create a relationship, and that's how they start the marketing process, by knowing exactly who in a company is probably part of at least a group of people that will assess whether or not I could ever use this type of product or service. And they'll maybe buy um, data from data.com, where you can buy huge lists of, of names, email addresses, phone numbers, and other stuff to complement what they dig up on LinkedIn. Um, and you can put them in categories, okay? So what are the top tools in the B2B toolkit? So you sit down and say, what are the different things I wanna do for networking, for discussion, I wanna share, or I wanna publish, all right? And how do I publish and stuff? So how many of you, when you go to book a hotel room, uh, look at the comments on the bottom of the page, okay? So every, you know, a fair number of hands go up. Everybody, everybody goes and says, all right, you know, there's a bunch of comments and it was, a, maybe it's a Holiday Inn or it's a small hotel, I don't know. But I look at the comments and how many of you figured that if all 100% are glowing, that some, most of them are fake and they deleted the bad ones, okay? But a bad one where the company mitigates and solves the problem is actually very positive, okay? So third party information is far more valuable than what you just say about yourself. You can have the nicest brochure where, but people who say third party, and that's one of the key things of social media is you get validation from independent people and it is far more believed by both business to business and business to, and by consumers, okay? Something that's really important to do. So <clears throat> we'll go through a couple things and say, what type of business are you building? They're not all the same. And these are direct quotes from Kevin Swan who is actually not with Inovia Capital right now, but it's one of the better venture capital companies in Canada. He's running a startup in Silicon Valley at the moment. And he says that most of the time you'll end up with uh, a good analog business. And an analog business that grows and you know, you know, makes a couple of million in you know, net revenue every year, it's a pretty good business. There's nothing wrong with that. You don't all have to raise money. You don't all have to do all sorts of stuff. You can just say, I wanna build a very, very good business that matches up with a certain marketplace. So small to medium sized business is the basis of the economy in Canada. So you can do that. And when you're trying to understand how do I measure, one of the key things is I go, okay, I'm gonna do this, but I wanna measure everything that happens. Go all the way through. 
So if I'm looking at a customer, I could say, what's the average order size? How long will this customer probably stay with me? Will I have them for a customer for three or four years? Um, what's the average time to the first order? How long does it make them to take for them to make a decision? Um, you know, how many new potentials do I put in my sales pipeline every month? And what's my close rate? And can I improve on it? All the other different items. And eventually, what's my revenue per salesperson and employee? So if I have a 20 person company in Vancouver, what do you think my annual revenue probably needs to be for that company to sustain itself? Sorry? Uh, 20 person company. So five million is a little high, but it's a minimum of two, probably in the three to four. And if it's a, a company that, let's say it's a biotech company where everybody has a ton of education, they're more expensive. Okay, it's like $100,000 minimum per person plus a little bit of other stuff. 20 person company needs to have 30, you know, 3 million, maybe 5 million in revenue. So when we look at companies, one of the things we often ask is how many employees do you have? And that tells us, a immediately tells us about the company. Unless you're venture funded and you're burning through somebody else's capital under the uh, assumption that you'll get it back later when you succeed, okay? So there's a bunch of things, but you have to measure and you have to understand what you're measuring. So. Stephen will talk about this more later on. You have pirate metrics, okay? And why do we call it pirate metrics? It's, it's R, right? Okay, what are, the, what are the words? It's, uh, hold on, put on my glasses. So it's uh, acquisition, activation, retention, referral, and revenue, okay? So pirates say R. So that's why it's called pirate metrics. And this is from Dave McClure and some of the other guys. So you go through the steps of what are the things I try to measure? And one of the things I would suggest everybody is to, when you get along a little bit, is to model how you would measure this. And because that'll help you understand whether you're doing things that are real or whether you're doing things which aren't real. And I'm just gonna close with a couple of pieces. Um, you can say, or you can look at stuff that's above the line and you can get tons of web traffic. You can get all sorts of unique visitors. Uh, they'll come back a whole bunch. Um, and you know you can have subscribers and all sorts of other stuff, but you may not be making any money. Okay, what's important is what's your conversion rate, and then churn is how many do I lose. So you can go through all sorts of interesting different iterations, but are you necessarily making money? So vanity metrics are things which get you a lot of attention, but maybe don't make you rich. Okay, so there's other things like that, and there's a really neat example. Uh, we don't have time to do it, but this is an example of a guy who is looking for a job and put up a website which is an absolute knockoff of Amazon. And for a while, he, uh, he actually had more web traffic because it, it went viral. And if any of you have a business plan based on going viral, you're fools. Okay, it very seldom happens. But he, he had a website that went viral and for a while he had more web traffic than some small countries and did really well. But it took him six months to get a job because all the web traffic didn't equal employment. Okay, so they're two different things. Um, neat ways to get metrics. Uh, some of the products we've talked about earlier on are very, very good at this. And you can get really good packages from some of the stuff. And quite often, uh, their individual products for one person are free or close to free, five or $10 a month. You can afford that. HubSpot has a really good free CRM product that everybody can use, but it's just a person or two. And Hootsuite has some similar things like that too. All right, some questions. How many of you have a product that sells itself? Nobody, don't put your hand up. <laughs> okay, all right. Um, if not, how will you spend your marketing budget? Because we went back to the beginning, segmentation, all the other things. How are you gonna spend the money? So let's say each one of you decides to put, take $25,000 out of your bank account, I'm gonna spend it, how do you spend it? That's the big thing. Or I'm gonna put a lot of time and effort in, how do you know you're spending your time effectively? Okay, so what I'd like everybody to do, there's these sheets are on the table. Um, I'm probably gonna run out of time, but I'd like everybody to go and say, for each segment, uh, identify which methods you will use. So this comes from the marketing wheel that was there. Here's the list of different things. And uh, then prioritize the methods, okay? And then say, as you go across, how much money am I gonna spend using each one of these systems? 
So two tips. <coughs> I've given you enough columns for two segments, right? If you have 10 segments, you have a big problem, okay? Because it's just, you cannot service a lot of segments at one time, all right? So two segments, and I'll also say that in this list of about 12 things, only do two, three, or four at the beginning. The biggest, actually just discard things you don't think are gonna work, and that'll tell you what you should do at the beginning, okay? I'm gonna advertise this way, or I'm gonna market this way. Um, what are the things I'm gonna do? And then how much do I think it's gonna cost me, and finally do I have the budget? And if you get a number that's far bigger than you appreciate, then you have to go back and start cutting stuff off. You have to start discarding things, and that's what you're looking to do, okay? Yeah, there's the list of, uh, here, you've got one? Yeah, there's the list of uh, different items that are there. And with that, I'm gonna close, okay? So you can take a bit of time to do it now or something you may wanna spend a bit of time really reflecting on, stuff like that. Um, I got just, there's a couple of books that are always good to read. Here's some of them. It's in the slide deck. Uh, Steve Blank's book is on the right-hand side. Crossing the Chasm, some of the others. Um, <clears throat> the idea for a lot of you is to go from first customer to first market. Make sure you have users and revenue, all right? And at the end of the day, how do I do very targeted marketing that pushes my business forward? How do I not waste my time, okay? And if you need to get hold of me, that's my contact info again, okay? Thank you very much. Yeah.